So the next section of, of the evening is, can I invite John and Keith to, uh, to the stage? John decided wants to be grilled by Keith for the next 15 minutes. So let me introduce uh, Keith. Keith Helford has been helping leaders of organisations across the sectors make the changes required for sustainable success since 1998. For example, NHS, NHS Trust and uh, Sports Partnerships uh, are just two of the examples. Uh, Keith is married to Annabelle. Why is that important? Well, Annabelle designed this lovely cover, and I think uh, John, you're exceedingly pleased with that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. Um, I've worked with John uh, a lot in the last few years, and on and off, probably for about 10 now, is it something like that? Um, but if he thinks that means I'm going to let him off easy. <laughs> Um, John, I, I, I would do actually want to add to what Mark said about how readable the book is. That may not be obvious in a way from what you've heard so far. It sounds quite technical, but it is ex in fact extremely readable and accessible. So I strongly recommend it from that point of view. Um, John, you, you start off with, you, you make quite a lot of the difference between information and information technology and the failure of information technology to actually provide information, at least in the way it's used by people. And we've heard a little bit about that from some of the speakers so far. But I, I think you kind of go further than that, really. I think you say somewhere, and I think I've heard you say in conversation anyway, something like, actually, the inf information is the organisation. Something like that. I think precisely that. Yeah. So can you, can, you, can you tease that out a little bit? Um, um, no. Um, I've got some notes in my pocket. Please <laughs> <laughs> rang me last night and so these are the questions I'm going to ask. That wasn't, that wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they're a fat lot of you. Clearly. <laughs> I, was, I was playing with the ideas yesterday, I did a, did a talk on this yesterday at Loughborough, and, and one of the thoughts was wandering through my head is how do you characterise this stuff to, to people? And in the chapter one or two, it talks about the homeostat as the, as the core entity from which the organisation is created. If we actually think about the homeostat, those of you who have read the book will know what I'm talking about. Um, those of you who won't, haven't, will get excited at this point. Um, but it's a feedback loop. And feedback loops run on information. So the technology is just there to carry the information around. Now it might be sort of hard technology, all these little great boxes that we all wander around the world with, um, and we might be moving the information around on that. Um, but equally, when we stand and have a conversation with each other, we talk to each other, what we're doing is exchanging information. And we use that information to control and guide how the organisation is going to work. So, and, and people tell you, we've had the conversation in the past, rip out all the technology in the sense of the great boxes and the bits of bell wire, you can still run the organisation. It still runs on the information. It's just these people exchanging it rather than the great boxes. So intr intrinsic to the whole operation is, is the flow of information. Absolutely. That's how it works. The exchange. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, another feature of the book that's been mentioned, although slightly less, I mean, is that it is, um, it is an important addition to you know, the, the, the literature of, of organization systems. Um, uh, could you just say something about what makes a systemic approach? quite so distinctive. I, just to qualify the question, I think we can probably relatively easily understand that organisations have a variety of different things going on in them, that there are lots of different bits of it, and in that sense it's complicated as a system. But thinking of it, what is it that thinking about it as a system gives you that's particularly distinctive? Gosh. Systems, organisations dealt with as a whole have characteristics, properties, behaviours that only exist in the whole, they don't exist in any of the parts. So if we stand outside the organisation and we try and describe it, if we take it apart and put the individual bits, the stuff that we find really interesting isn't there. Because it only exists in the interactions of the parts of the organisation. So when we rip it apart, we find that what we're looking for has gone. Um, so we look at, we can observe an organisation, I've, I've been blogging about expenses recently, some of you may have read, um, and, and I was looking at a particular example yesterday, I think to myself, I now know, having looked at the expenses process in, in 
a railway business as it happens. Um, I now know everything I need to know about the entire organization. Because what I found was that the expensive process is a sort of microcosm of the culture and the values and the process and the information process. That this sort of characterizes how the organization works. It's really, really interesting. But if you, if you come at it from the outside um, and then try and take it apart, all the interesting stuff isn't there. I, I, have, I kind of like follow that up, but I can't. I've got to keep moving. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, some people may be feeling, um, having heard other people talk about the book and seeing some of the, the, the diagrams and so on, and seeing lots of you know lines and arrows and so on, may be feeling it's rather technical, rather even rather a kind of hard kind of set of concepts. Perhaps uh, you talk about how applicable your idea ideas are, your thinking is, in a more uh, values focused kind of organisation, a more socially focused organisation, where maybe softer concepts are more the norm. Well, like Fusion 21, for example, <laughs> which is a social enterprise. Well, as Mark says, it, first of all, it has to be an enterprise before it can be social. So it has to make a profit before it can do with the useful things that it exists to do. And, and there's, a, there's a well known order of, of, of nuns, um, some of whom might be present in the room, you have to look around. Um, uh, um, uh, an organisation seven or eight years ago was, was, was fundamentally challenged about what its future might look like and how it might run. Um, and I suppose I was not as gentle as I might have been from time to time with some of the conversations. But the reality is that the organisation, if it is to fulfil its social desires and obligations, and to express its values, to its customers has to fundamentally run itself well first. The challenge, of course, with writing a book um, is that you have to use words. A bit of a blow, really. Um, <laughs> because a lot of what is expressed in values is not very often expressed in words terribly well. It's expressed in gestures and contact and relationships, which are very, very hard to describe without using sometimes technical language. So my, my sort of proxy for everything is the homeostat. That's the basis of the, of the survival organization, the intelligent organization. And it's a feedback loop. Now, whether you construct a feedback loop from hard stuff or soft stuff, it is nonetheless a feedback loop. And I've used that as the, as the sort of proxy for trying to describe relationships. Matthew is sitting over there giggling, probably. Um, Matthew's my, my younger son. Because from time to time, as I was writing the book and sharing, exchanging ideas with him, he's got a much greater insight to psychology than I have. And he kept saying, Dad, you need to read this bit. Um, and I found that very, very helpful. Whether I captured everything that he wanted me to capture, I'm not quite sure. But trying to get the soft stuff into a descriptive, what would be as technocratic language is quite difficult. <coughs> quite difficult. Um, I mean, another way, of, another, another way of looking at it, um, because actually, I think, as I said, I think it is very accessible, very readable makes a lot of human sense. Um, uh, it's quite a high concept, if you like, in a way. Um, what would you say to those people, you know, those kind of hard-headed types who just want to get it down, just want results, just, just, you know, get there? Um, probably they need to get over themselves to some extent. <laughs> um, and, 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 and yeah, we, we've all been there, and, and you're right. Um, if you want to drive short-term savings and short-term efficiency gains, of course it is possible to do it, and of course it's possible to abuse the model in order to do so. You can drive cost out quite quickly. Um, but if you abuse the human beings in the organization by maltreating them or underpaying them or not rewarding them in whatever way, shape or form, or not nurturing them, they'll all shop off and work for somebody nicer, and you won't be in business. So um, it is really helpful, Mark's alluded to it, James has alluded to it, in saving cost in the business, in improving business performance, and that is critically important that we do that. But at the same time, we have to balance that by caring for the people in the organization in an appropriate way, so that they are still there in 10 or 20 years' time, so that you know, hopefully, in a few years' time, they're better than us, and they're all there to earn our pensions for us. Um, how, am I, how are we doing for time, Tom? Fine. Have we got time to invite the audience to yes, ask yeah. a question or two? Um, would anybody like to ask John a question? Graham. John, the moment you write a book, you, you, you finish, you publish, but you're still continuing to work. So what would be the next chapter? What are you working on now? Um, oh, gosh. Um, there's a point 
apologies to Charles wherever you are. Charles, I'd really like to write a whole chapter just about the NHS, particularly after the last couple of weeks of, of, of watching what's going on. And I think there's um, there is some transformation happening in the in, in the private sector, in the sort of commercial part of the of the world, which is sort of driving itself and will eventually work its way through. I think there are some really really big challenges around government um, and how we run a country. And I think. Uh, the intelligent organisation brackets has run a country close brackets. Would be quite fun uh, as a to try and write. And I think, uh, in, in all seriousness, the challenges of uh, how we will how we will run countries in the future and how we will distribute power, how we will you know, you've got this country, you've got um, you know, the localisation agenda, the regionalisation stuff. You've got people like core cities driving devolution. We've got Scotland, we've got Wales, we've got Northern Ireland. We've got a bit of a challenge with how Europe's going to be run. There's a really interesting space to say, could we have an intelligent country? Chris <laughs> <laughs> Carroll, yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's very. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, John, I'd like to hear about what goes on beyond the walls of the organisation. I mean, I'm, I'm running a startup that deals with the, with the collaborative community and the relationships and the information flows between those, uh, those things. Um, how does this translate beyond the organisation? Um, well, what's the organisation, I suppose, might be the question, but Keith's doing that for his PhD, so we better not go there. <laughs> still, still his son will be a very boring leader in about three years' time. Um, <coughs> the boundary to the organisation, as with any system, is where you choose to put it. So yes, we have legal boundaries in the sense that there is a legal entity which is described as Arup or Atkins or whatever, um, and there are some sort of legal boundaries around that. But increasingly, whether it's one organisation or many, um, the, the boundary to the organisation is not the legal boundary that exists around the, around the, the legal entity, but it's the, the boundary that exists around the group of people who have chosen to call themselves that organisation the conversation Brian and Thomas and myself are having at the moment in, in the research space, where you have 13 or 14 universities and an equivalent number of utilities and infrastructure owners and operators collaborating in a grand research project. But there are something like 26, 27 minimum legal boundaries, but the organisation of research sits at a higher order for that, so it's a better organisation that sits beyond the legal boundary. And you have to persuade everybody to think of it in those terms and deal with the sort of recursive nature of the organisation. Actually, this is an emerging, it's interesting, it's an emergent property of all the bits that, that come together. Yeah. So the organisation that we are managing yeah, is higher order to the individual organisations that make it up. Much as the, the, the legal institution is higher order than the individual. <coughs> Doug, I wanted to say something. Ask a question. Yes, I, I'd like to ask a question. I mean, John's wife, Sarah, might not like this question because it might lead to a new book. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, um, it, it took my glance through the book. I saw the draft, but haven't seen the book itself. And it, it is accessible from my point of view. Um, but Tom, in his introduction, talked about leading edge research in uh, to do with emotions during the recent election. So on, how these are oscillating and changing. In the, in the 20th century approach to emotion is sort of um, highlighted here in one of your titles, John, Damping Hot Response, which, which I agree needs damping. But, but the 21st century approach to emotions is that it's a sort of signaling function. Emotions are a signaling function in the sense that they give focus to things that matter and they actually contribute to the intelligence of individuals and organisations. Emotions are, are crucial and are probably harmless, a part of the intelligence and I suggest with the organisation as well. And I know you know that, but how do you harness it, John? I'm not sure if you do in a, in a, in a sort of traditional <coughs> sense. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a huge piece for me, um, and in that particular expression used in the book um, about dancing hot response, the notion that um, to, to me, I love this. To me, it's because I'm dancing on the stage. Um, it's 
to make to make the organisation work, we have to have the emotional engagement. People have to get the idea. They have to belong. They have to have a sense of belonging and ownership and all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, emotions are things which belong to individuals. And I think that the, the, the point I think I'm trying to make in the book um, is that we as human beings tend to react to the things that are presented to us. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's intelligent, John. It's intelligent. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm I'm not sure. Not <laughs> very, I think, is the answer to that. Information taken over. It's a wireless <laughs> connection in the room, I think. It's yeah. very probably somebody's phones ringing silently in the background. Um, I think if, if our organisations are going to be successful or are going to be sustainable in whatever way, shape or form they may play in the future exist, the individuals within them have to have freedom, the autonomy and the skill, the wit, to recognise their own hot responses and dump them for themselves and choose, positively choose, to respond hot or not. So there's a, there's a, a rational hotness to, to the response. And if we can get that into the individuals and the individuals working together, then you can look at it and say, okay, yeah, how do we actually now institutionally like make use of that? But I think yeah, there's, a, there's a really big tension. If you're a, if you're a university, I was in a university yesterday, dreadful place. Um, great big property companies uh, that, that sort of have lots and lots of students in them as a mechanism for paying for the property. Um, and, and, and they credentialise a whole bunch of 19 and 20 year olds and sort of churn them out with badges that say, yes, you sat in and studied for three years and all that. They're dreary places, aren't they? But we need to sort of flip the whole thing around the other way and say, you know, actually, how do, we, how do we encourage, engage people so that they get excited, so that we get the hot response, they're excited, they're stimulated. They're engaged in what they want to do, and they go and do it, and we have to find a mechanism for evaluating and scoring it, rather than the other way around. And if we, we do that in the organisations, I think uh, Alan, you were talking about engaging people, James talks about engaging people, Mark talks about engaging people. You know, we want those people to go, yeah, that's exciting, I want to do it. And then we have to work out how we put the institutional mechanism behind it that holds it all together, rather than deciding from Alan's brand office in southern Germany that the world is going to be Toshiba flavoured and it's going to look like it's a sort of 12 inch square. So it doesn't work and it won't work in the future because individuals want to exercise their individuality. I'm not sure that answered the question, but I enjoyed saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think our time, or my time anyway, is up. So I'll keep it back. John, thank you very much.